So the goal, the goal for tonight is to really um, present the, uh, the wild and awesome forces that our forest and landscape are exposed to either on a yearly basis, annual basis, or every century or so. Um, the ways that it's, uh, those forces have been messed up or tinkered with over time. And then also some of those forces that we just kind of ignore and hope that don't happen anytime soon. So, so with that, um, we'll take a look at some, uh, some quotes. I usually don't like to put up a lot of words on a screen, but I think um, uh, this is a, a great way to kind of tie in uh, both the historical society and, and what we do as, as ecologists. And the idea is that, um, you know, we, uh, if we, if we ignore our past events, uh, past uh, things that humans have done, past things that nature has done, we just can't really explain what's going on in today's, uh, in today's world. Um, and so with that, let's take a look at essentially what people thought about um, when they came to the new world, when people ex were coming into the, what we call the forest primeval, the, the, the virgin forest, the untouched forest. Um, I really like this quote, or this, this kind of uh, uh, hodgepodge of quotes put together, but that, that last one talking about preadamate trees scattered about the forest floor, like ancient monuments of Egypt, Greece, and Rome. Um, you can imagine what um, you know, Europeans came across in the forest, these monster trees blown to the ground, never uh, salvaged or logged, and just laid like matchsticks. Um, much different than what we have out here today. Um, and so, uh, anyone is, a, is a, an uh, art buff or loves painting, there's Thomas Cole and his painting of uh, the Oxbow uh, in uh, Northampton, Massachusetts. And you know, this painting is really kind of what these European settlers wanted to do. On, the, um, uh, on your right hand side is the pastoral scene of, of, uh, of settlers coming through, taming the wilderness, taming that, uh, the, the sublime as, as you would call it. Um, and then uh, on the left hand side is, is that wilderness. You can see the stormy, the birds are, are swarming, the trees are gnarly and decaying. Um, it's essentially something that needed to be tamed. Um, and that's how they saw our, our woodlands and, and imposed our order on it. They, they came from Europe. Um, and they brought their habits, uh, they brought their, uh, their culture with them, and they were going to, by God, uh, put it onto the American landscape. Um, that, that sense of sublime, that sense of wilderness, even at the beginning of the 20th century, could still be found out there in the woods. Um, the, uh, the, the Harvard Tract, if you're familiar with that, in, in, such as surrounded by Pisgah, um, it was one of those tracts, 400-year-old uh, pine, never touched by, uh, by European settlers, uh, never cut, um, anything like that, never farmed even. And in 1925, um, actually earlier than that, uh, Harvard University bought it to study, and um, just these massive old trees uh, out in the woods. Um, and so uh, w with, that, uh, with that purchase of, um, of property uh, came the idea as well as the, with the Climax Forest. That forest that they purchased, that 20 acres, uh, was essentially at that climax, was at a steady state. The idea was that the, uh, the forest reached a certain point and it was just kind of self-replacing over time. One tree died, another tree came up to fill the gap uh, and it just reached that climax or old growth site um, of succession. And, uh, you know, do we have a pointer? Yes, we do. Yes. So the idea with these is that you actually be kind of stuck in these top end levels here, never going back to here uh, during that climax state. Um, so if we take a look at the landscape of Pisgah, the, uh, the big red blob here is essentially the 13,000 acres, and this little tiny piece in here is that Harvard track surrounded by, uh, by Pisgah. Um, Pisgah at the time in the 20s uh, was pretty uh, wild country. Some of it was farmed, some of it was heavily logged, but a good portion, about a third of it, uh, was, never, uh, was never touched. And so it was pretty wild. It was pretty, um, um, it, it essentially looked like the original forest when the Europeans showed up, even in the early uh, 20th century. Um, but something dramatic happened. Uh, in uh, 1938, uh, that's the, uh, the Long Island Express came to uh, New England. Um, there was a hurricane in September that blew over about half of our, our forest land. Uh, Keene was not spared at all, uh, as you can see in this picture. This is actually um, uh, Ladies Wildwood Park. Um, and then qu quite quickly after that, even uh, you know, in the winter and into uh, the, the following years, that timber was salvaged. Uh, partly to, to recoup some of the losses of, of that uh, valuable timber at the time, but at the same time, uh, it was also fuel reduction too, uh, or hazard reduction for fires. Uh, so getting rid of that, that slash, that material uh, away from homes, away from infrastructure was very important to do, and so there was a big effort to do that. You can imagine what people had to do with horses to drag, drag that material out. Uh, just, just, just tons and tons of logs just, just laid on the ground. 
Um, at the same time, the the, um, the log price has plummeted because you can imagine with those uh, that uh, the amount of timber on the market, uh, it wasn't worth anything. It was a simple supply and demand. So the uh, U.S. Forest Service stepped in with the Northeast Timber Salvage Administration and essentially bought out all the timber. Uh, from landowners as a bailout pa package, as you can imagine, and uh, stored the logs in ponds. So this is Connors Pond and uh, Peter Sham Mass, but Spotford Lake, all the lakes and ponds around here were subject to uh, having logs floating in them to preserve them. And over time, they would uh, be pulled out um, uh, either into mills that were on, uh, on the lake side or, or portable mills um, that were moved to the lake um, in process and put in back into the market. Uh, I like this slide because it just shows what was going on in the 40s as well as was World War II and this, this is a sawmill in Concord that was totally run by women at the time. Um, it's kind of a unique, unique story there, yeah, yay. Um, but um, there's a great book called They Sawed Up a Storm. It's all about that, uh, uh, that, that sawmill in Turkey Pond. Um, the harbor track was not spared from the hurricane. There's a 400-year-old white pine and, and hemlock in that stand uh, and that was also blown over at the time. Um, and you, know, you can see as it, as it looked there, um, there's actually a little uh, gentleman hanging out right there. Um, the only difference is that the Harvard track was never salvaged. Um, Harvard decided to leave it as is, leave it untouched as it was uh, when they bought it. Uh, and the Harvard track today is, is, is still a pretty amazing place. You can actually see the, uh, these ancient monuments kind of just standing on the, scattered across the forest floor as it was described by, um, by Europeans in the 1700s. Um, it's pretty amazing to walk through that forest where you have those logs three or four feet in diameter just laying on the ground, still, still pretty solid. They're 80 years old today. It's pretty amazing. Um, stuff you don't see across the landscape. If you go, if you go into Pisgah and the surrounding environs, um, most of those big, that big timber was picked up. It was hauled off, it was floated in ponds and slowly put into sawmills over time. Um, and if you take a look at the, the, uh, these, two, uh, uh, these two photographs, probably you know, maybe half a mile from each other, uh, in Pisgah or in the, you know, in the, in the state park. Um, similar uh, forest type, essentially, same, same slope perhaps, um, but definitely missing these, these large monuments uh, that are just laying dead on the ground. Um, the roles of those, you know, we've yet to really know. I mean, there's a lot of things, a lot of questions we have about these things. So again, uh, we go back to that, um, that sublime. I, li I like to think nowadays, um, instead of it, uh, Humans moving from, uh, from right to left, maybe we're trying to push it a little bit further to the right now. For, so instead of going, uh, uh, instead of the, the pasture advancing, we're maybe we're trying to put a little more wilderness back out there in the landscape. Um, so Hugh Raup uh, was a, uh, an ecologist at uh, Harvard as well, and he essentially was thinking that, you know, if we take a look at what we have going on in the landscape today with uh, natural disturbance, strong wind events, hurricanes, fires, um, flooding, things like that. We could probably surmise that that was happening probably before we came as well. And he was right. You know, um, large hurricanes, natural disturbances were happening well before we showed up. It's not like we brought them from Europe. Um, and uh, for the most part, he was correct. You know, there's some things that he's ignoring. We've changed a lot of things in the landscape as well. Um, maybe in '57, we, we didn't have as much of a um, you know a, a, of a dam system established across the United States or even New England, but um, uh, uh, but um, and beavers at that time were just coming back from extirpation. So um, there are some things missing that he uh, he kind of ignores. But for the most part, um, the forest that we have out in New England today uh, was affected um, uh, was was essentially maybe similar to what we had prior to settlement. Meaning we had old growth. We had very young growth scattered across the landscape. It wasn't just all old growth or steady state. So that, that vision of Pisgah um, was just a snapshot in time. Uh, and that same site 400 years ago may have been burned to the ground. Um, it may have been blown over. Uh, it may have been very young thicket there where, where rabbits made a living. Um, and we, we see this through, through soil analysis, looking at soil layers. Um, Seven major hurricanes have been found from 19, uh, 1620 uh, to, to 1950, uh, affecting New England uh, over time. And those major hurricanes obviously didn't affect every single acre of, of New England, but over time you can see there's, there's a buildup of, of effects that you have, um, of you know, uh, major hurricanes replacing stands in our forest uh, in that time period maybe twice or three times. Um, and so uh, these, are, these are hurricanes that would essentially blow the forest over like it did in 38. So hurricanes are, are, are very common in New England. Uh, it's just that the time scale is very long, right? So the interval for those is about every 75 to 150 years. Uh, the hurricane of 38 was about 80 years ago. So I always tell people that we're due. 
we're in that time frame now where a major hurricane comes through, so, so you can sleep well tonight. <laughs> Again, the Hurricanes, uh, uh, Wheelock Park, that's the entrance of Wheelock Park right here. Uh, if you look close, the, the, that, that metal frame is bent over. The, there's a metal frame there now only to be replaced. Um, but just, just a devastating effect on the landscape. Again, not, you know, when hurricanes show up, uh, they don't do this on every acre, but um, you know, our forests have adapted over time to, 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 um, to essentially uh, uh, take, take this beating. Um, you know, the question in the, in the Concord Monitor could, um, what if the Hurricane of 38 hit again today? Um, this is a state house, actually. I like, I like the little fellow up here hanging on the tree. Um, but uh, it's a good question because it's only a matter of time. Um, so the big trees we have out here are definitely prone to these winds. Um, doesn't mean we should go out and cut them all, but it's just the realization that the, you know, there will be a big wind that will hit this area again. It could be five years from now, it could be 50 or 100 years from now. It's just it's tough to tell. But uh, if history serves us correctly, it's, it's, it's going to happen. Uh, and our forests have, have evolved over time to handle that. Um, this is a survey by Charles Sargent uh, in 1880, looking at, uh, in, in the year 1880, how much farmland was burned over at the time. Um, <coughs> Southwest New Hampshire is, is that uh, kind of that, that second color. I think I'm pointing at that. Um, and uh, that's, that's about 1% of, of these farms are burned. Uh, in 1880. It's a pretty small number, but considering uh, burning of land was usually associated with land clearing a lot of times, not always, but especially early settlers, uh, most of the, of the wood that was cut was burned just because it, it was something that was in the way. Uh, so we, uh, burning of wood uh, on farms is usually associated with land clearing. 1880s was a pretty uh, uh, tough time to be farming in New Hampshire. And most people have moved west at that point. So there's a lot of farm abandonment happening. So when I see that maybe even 1% of our landscape was being burned at the time uh, due to uh, escape fires, due to agriculture, uh, still, t t I can probably surmise, or you probably think about that even earlier, that, that, that number was even higher, especially during the peak of land clearing, also during the peak of, uh, uh, of farming itself. Um, fire plays a pretty big role uh, in our landscape, although we've ignored it. Native Americans uh, have used it as a tool to clear land uh, for, for grazing and pastures. Um, fires escape, fires travel into the, into the forest in the right conditions. Um, the Harvard Tract, pictured here at different times, uh, was established in the 1600s, uh, the, or the trees were established in the 1600s, and the, uh, those trees came in following a hurricane that burnt, and, that, and then the site burned after that. It's a typical cycle that we have here, where we have a ca catastrophic hurricane, all that fuel is on the ground, lightning strikes it, and we have a fire that runs through here. Um, so fire definitely plays a role in the regenerating forest. Um, Owls had fire in 1907, burned 10,000 acres in the White Mountain National Forest. Um, it was a result due to uh, logging material left behind, but it was hit by lightning. Uh, so again, that fuel load was there and it probably mimicked a hurricane fuel load. Uh, but again, str struck by lightning and, and went on its way. The Marlow fire uh, in 1941, just north of here in Marlow and Stoddard, um, uh, about 25,000 acres burned. Uh, and uh, that was a hurricane, uh, hurricane debris across the landscape that was uh, set off by an accidental fire at a sawmill. Um, so again, a human, human cause there, but, not, but if it weren't for the hurricane, it wouldn't be so devastating. Beavers. We tend to ignore beavers nowadays, uh, partly because they, at one point we didn't have beavers in New Hampshire, so the effects of beavers uh, was missing on the landscape. Um, and nowadays, too, we don't let beavers be beavers anymore. They're either trapped, they're moved, they're killed. Um, their dams are knocked over. Um, their dams are, are deceived by beaver deceivers. Um, and so beavers have become more of a nuisance along the landscape, uh, and they've now allowed to flood what they would naturally flood prior to, to settlement. This is, a, the, um, at the time, the world's largest beaver dam. is about a half a mile long in Alberta, uh, Canada. Some fellow went out, hiked out there to make, so he could pin it on Google Earth, um, so he'd be like the first guy getting there. But, um, but they, they can be pretty impressive. Of course, Alberta is a different landscape than, say, southwestern New Hampshire, but you can imagine sites that are flat, have plenty of, of, of marshes, beaver could really uh, make a difference. And you can imagine when the beavers move on or are killed, uh, killed by wolves or, killed by, uh, or just natural causes, other natural causes, the dams uh, fall apart, that beaver dam goes away, uh, and that force comes back up and regenerates. You have that young forest regenerating at that point. Associated with beavers, uh, just with the waters flooding, um, Main Street in Keene, 1936. Um, 
I was trying to figure out exactly where this was. I think it's actually further down Main Street. But um, floods, we don't let we don't let rivers be rivers anymore either. They don't flood as they do. Keene rarely floods like it like it did prior to the dams of the Surrey Dam or uh, even uh, other other uh, communities such as Peterborough or or Concord with the Army Corps of Engineers uh, establishing their dams across uh, across the landscape. Uh, flooding has been controlled. With floods comes. Um, Comes some tree mortality, trees being ripped out of the banks, uh, floodplains being disturbed, uh, and forest popping up behind them. Here's a, uh, a picture of the uh, of, uh, of Route 9, Route 202 coming across here. Um, you can see the flood flood control installations. This line here, these straight lines. Uh, there's a causeway here. Um, essentially, just showing that you know on that landscape, uh, we're not allowing that river to flood as it should or as it would. Um, and so the, the natural processes of forest succession, the forest being knocked over, uh, the forest being altered, uh, is just not happening anymore uh, in, in those areas. For good reason, though. We, we live in these areas, so we don't, we don't want the flooding, obviously. Um, sticking with wetlands, too, uh, the advancement and, and, and contraction of wetlands. Um, this is uh, right in, uh, in Jaffrey here, nice wetland complex. But if you look closely, you can see these lines. Going across the wetland, those are drainage lines that you would see. So farmers recognizing the, the potential of um, of our of our you know of our wetlands and, and how how well they grew vegetation um, was just a little too wet at the time. So they'd actually ditch these wetlands to uh, drain some of the water out of there uh, to allow for grazing, to allow for hay production. Um, quite often, uh, there's uh, people who say, "Oh, the best the best hay field used to be over there." And you look over there, and it's a it's a beaver pond or it's a wetland. Um, and that's because at one time they did, they did drain them. If you look a little closer with LIDAR, um, this is just showing that uh, you can see these, these ditches again right here. Same site, just different, using uh, laser technology to, to show it off. Also, uh, if you go to Boston, you start looking at the Charles River. Uh, you can imagine at the time, you can start seeing these lines in these, in these meadows here um, scattered throughout. Um, these old wetlands and it is, is the same idea as that having uh, having pastures, having hay production close to the market, you can fatten your animals up pretty easily and, and ship them off uh, into the ports. Uh, but again, these these meadows very very valuable to um, uh, to, to the farmers, um, and these meadows would ebb, ebb and flow. They would they would flood over time. They would be drained uh, if not drained by settlers. Ice jams. Um, we see these now and again with uh, on the news. Uh, uh, you, you can imagine these massive blocks of ice floating down the Connecticut River, hitting a floodplain. Um, if, you're in, if you're in Walpole, you can imagine uh, where you see cornfields, there most likely was a floodplain forest there. That floodplain forest would be mowed over by these massive blocks of ice. That mowed over forest would regenerate into a younger one and, and start, start, uh, um, start a new rotation there. Um, so again, with the, co combined with the flooding and, uh, and the ice, uh, just the reset of the forest along our, along our streams and rivers. Uh, pictures up north. Um, this fellow had a pretty unique experience with uh, what he calls rafts. Uh, these these large log jams, and and not and not you know a few logs here and there, but log jams, tens of feet tall, hundreds of feet long, just in the you know in a major river. Um, and uh, in Seoul, you actually have vegetation growing on, on, the, uh, uh, on the logs in there. So you talked about you know uh, moving through brambles and uh, which no doubt uh, raspberries uh, and, and other. Uh, other shrubs are growing right on the logs that are right on top of the water. So almost, almost having a bridge of wood um, caused by natural, um, natural buildup of logs floating down the river over time. Um, so you, you could imagine uh, this picture of Westmoreland here. Um, you know, th these banks loaded with wood. Um, that wood was, re was removed over time. Oh, excuse me, got ahead of myself. Um, a good example is Mount St. Helens and some of the, some of the, the uh, um, the streams that are uh, coming down the mountain there, uh, wood that was blown over during the, the explosion or the eruption of Mount St. Helens, and over time that wood has made it, it, itself in, or found itself into the stream. Um, that's actually there's water, there's a stream underneath that, especially that, uh, that that amount of wood there. So it's pretty impressive stuff. Over time that breaks down, or a major flood comes and sweep, sweeps that away, and just like those ice jams, uh, that massive block of wood just floating down the river, just ripping out uh, the floodplain forest at the time. Of course, we had other priorities on our rivers for, for travel up north and even on the Connecticut River and other places. We move wood, uh, pulp wood, and, and other uh, other products down the river. So removing those 
uh, those log jams, straightening and channelizing our streams was a priority just to, for transportation. Uh, rivers were by far the easiest way to move products up and down uh, or across the landscape. Uh, and so they were, they were streamlined, just like we do with our highways today. Again, the Anascoggin River, just loaded with wood during the spring drive. And when, those, uh, when, those, when we actually had log jams of, of pulpwood, they would just stick some dynamite in that jam and just blow it up just to keep it flowing. Pretty, pretty impressive there. The log jam there. Yeah. Um, all to get to the mill, just down, down river. And so you, most of our mills uh, for, for, for pulp production or paper production were along, along major riverways. Those riverways cleared out, preventing um, you know, floodplain forests from being uh, reset by, by natural floods. This is a light catch. You know, we, there's pictures that Fish and Game has of, the, of uh, these massive deer kills going out. Uh, people, you know, killing dozens of deer um, uh, when there was really no catch limit on there. Um, so you can imagine the population of deer plummeting during these times um, or being, very, you know, pretty low. And uh, the pressure for deer to feed on vegetation um, uh, was gone. And so you imagine uh, seedlings like oak and maple being able to establish and make it up into the canopy when deer uh, were not as, uh, as a higher pressure. So uh, a positive for the forest. Ice storms, um, 2008, 1998, uh, the early 60s in the upper valley. Um, uh, this is a regular uh, uh, d disturbance that we have in our forest. Uh, it can be pretty ca catastrophic where stands of the, or uh, you know, acres and acres are laid on the ground or just be a single tree here and there. Uh, but definitely a disturbance that we have in the forest. Insect outbreaks, um, forest tent caterpillar. This is not the caterpillar that produces those tents that you have out there, but it is called, it, it does produce a little tiny one. Um, this scenario here, we actually had uh, a lot of uh, uh, canopy dieback. Um, this is actually in June, believe it or not. So this, this should be fully closed canopy. Uh, allows for this, this understory to erupt uh, and to develop this, this beautiful shrub layer underneath. Um, uh, but this is a natural disturbance that happens uh, across the landscape every year. Other things that are, uh, may seem natural, but we cause the chestnut blight. That's a shift in species in our forest. Chestnut was by far the most dominant tree, uh, especially further south as you go, again, to the Connecticut or into Massachusetts. But chestnut definitely played a dominant role in our forest. And that tree, uh, when, that can when the canopy of chestnut died off, there was a chance for other, other trees, other forests to establish underneath it and erupt up. The same thing goes today with, with white ash and the emerald ash borer, um, where we have uh, pure stands of ash or, or ash is a large component in our forest, uh, the, um, there's the chance for that, that canopy to die off fairly quickly in a new, a new forest, a new layer to erupt underneath it. Wind. Um, wind, just like hurricanes, is by far the most common disturbance we have in our forest that resets things. Um, it can be as large as, the, uh, as a 2008 tornado that ran through central New Hampshire, about 50 miles long, leveling about 8,000 acres worth of land, worth of forest land. Um, it could be a little smaller, such as the microburst in 2010 in Harrisville. Um, it was actually a, recent, a more recent one in Harrisville as well um, that we have here, where you know, the forest is just ravaged, laid to the ground, an acre here, an acre there. Um, or it could be a single tree fall from one, you know, one tree not so stable. Uh, all these have different effects in the forest. Uh, all these produce a different, a different type of forest that comes up in, underneath it. Um, but definitely is something that happens on the landscape every year. And of course, logging. Um, you know, we are, in New Hampshire have been logging for about 400 years. Uh, we've been taking trees out. Um, we've gotten pretty efficient at it, so we can move pretty quickly at it, but that is definitely a, a disturbance that we use uh, to our benefit, but it's also a disturbance that can benefit wildlife with that too, and Matt will get into that. Despite all these disturbances across the landscape, despite all the logging you see going across the landscape, we're pretty fortunate still to have a pretty close canopy out there. This is uh, Route 123 in, in Hancock, um, pretty untouched, uh, kind of the, the epicenter of the Harris Center, actually. Um, but pretty fortunate to have that, uh, that landscape close canopy, uh, forested. That, that's great if you're a forest critter. Um, besides logging, Another natural disturbance, perhaps the, by far the most uh, uh, impactful disturbance that we've had caused by humans on the landscape was, was the, the sheep craze, or the, the, uh, the clearing of land for agriculture in New England. Um, 1830s, 1850s, about the, uh, the height of agriculture in, uh, in New England. 
Cheshire County in 1880. Um, we found that about, uh, uh, this is the same sergeant survey, about half the county uh, was covered with woods, which means the other half was covered in some sort of farmland or non-wood type thing. If it wasn't farmland, it was probably abandoned farmland, shrub, scrub, um, you know, really, really rough pastures, things like that. Um, you know, compared to uh, Coas County, where probably about nine tenths, about 90% was still forested up there. So, big portion of, of Cheshire County cleared for, for agriculture. The further south you go, the higher the number of clearing uh, you'll see. But the 1850s and on, there was the abandonment of farming in New England. People walking away from their farms, selling land, no longer plowing it, no longer grazing. Um, and as you know, if you stop mowing anything, the trees start to pop up over time. Um, and that's what they did. Um, and by you know, the early 20th century, we actually had a new forest, a second growth forest coming up, uh, where you know, most of the time white pine would come into that abandoned field. Um, and that white pine was really harvested for boxes, uh, for building materials, you name it. Um, it was really just, it wasn't really um, forestry per se, it was more just clear cutting of a, of a product and, um, and, uh, and shipping that off to market. Following that, that, those pines being kind of cut off the landscape, you would actually have a regrowth of usually hardwood or a mixed wood type of scenario, um, kind of the forest kind of reverting back to once it, what it once was, um, and then growing up into the forest you see today. If it wasn't clear cut in the early, or before 1938, or even harvested in 1938, it was most likely blown over in 1938. Um, so again, about half of our landscape was blown over. The other half was probably too young or too, uh, too small of a structure to be, uh, to be blown over. Uh, so it survived the hurricane and continued to grow. Um, and the, you know, the cool thing, despite all these amazing uh, uh, disturbances uh, uh, that we've had throughout time, we still have these big trees on the landscape just ready to become those, those ancient monuments as described earlier on. Um, um, it's pretty impressive to see them out there still. And you know, again, despite everything that goes on in the forest, both destructive and, uh, um, and natural, um, and natural being destructive sometimes as well, but um, about 85, 84%, as Tom mentioned, uh, of New Hampshire is still forested, which is pretty impressive. Um, and the majority is, is this kind of hardwood type of scenario that we see out there. Um, the number I want to point at is the, uh, how much of it is privately owned. If you, if you come from out west, that, that number would probably be opposite. 75% kind of federal or state or publicly owned. 76% um, is owned privately. So that could be family, family ownership, but it could also be uh, um, companies as well. But um, it's pretty amazing to see that, that type of ownership here in New Hampshire and also in uh, New England in general. Um, in our forests, we can see the history that's, that's gone on over time. So you can walk through um, the forest and see different types of trees or different forms of trees out there. Uh, you can have the tree that's been managed for timber nice and straight over time. You can have the tree that was, that was blown over but survived the hurricane, just bent uh, one way. You can have the tree that grew up in the open and as the forest surrounded it, um, as, as that old pasture kind of grew up around it, um, the limbs were, were kind of pruned, pruned off naturally and you actually have these stubs out there. So it's pretty amazing to see the history that's out there uh, and on one wood lot you can have that just kind of hanging out. Um, so I, I tend to think of New Hampshire's forest as species rich, maybe 20, 30 species, tree species out there across the landscape. Um, but for the most part, we're pretty structurally and uh, age class poor. Our forest can range anywhere from uh, establishing after the hurricane of 38, 38 and maybe 30, 50 years prior to that. Um, so a plus or minus 30 years and the life of the forest is actually pretty small. Uh, so we, we, our forest tends to be that kind of 80 to 120 uh, age class out there. Um, and it's because of this kind of dynamic that we have. This is a very oversimplified uh, uh, history of our forest, but you can look at two major events that happen, uh, I'm sorry, three, looking at the abandonment of our, uh, of our, uh, of our woodlands uh, in the 1800s, and then our forest coming right back. They're either cut, uh, or too small to be cut at the time and, uh, and continue to grow. If they were continuing to grow, they were blown over by the hurricane. Um, and again, if they were cut, they were too small to be blown over by the hurricane uh, and they continue to grow. Leaving us with a scenario today where we have the bulk of our forest, um, kind of in this middle age, pretty robust, pretty good healthy forest, uh, 100 plus or minus years old um, and doing pretty well. If we look at the habitat that we have out there, um, we can, we can see that when we say successional habitat, that's that young forest habitat. Um, with the habitat, 
follows, uh, follows the animals as well. So where we have animals that rely on young successional forests, such as rough grouse, uh, when it peaked in the early 1800s, so their populations in a steady decline. Um, pretty interesting. So with wildlife, we want, we want all this. Uh, with forests, we want all this too. I just went through a long list of disturbances that can affect our forest. And if we all have our forest in one basket, essentially if it's all the same age or same structure or same age class, and, and a uh, disturbance comes along and that affects the age class, then our landscape's in trouble. Um, so if everything is in this, this older age class like it is today, and a disturbance comes along and kind of whacks it, then um, we're gonna have a lot of, a, a lot of our acreage on, on the ground. Um, and we can see that we are in this older age class, just looking at uh, some, some kind of indicator species of, uh, of older forest. The pileated woodpecker needs large old trees uh, to make a living, to feed on those carpenter ants and other, other things, feeding on that, those, those dying or, or dead trees. Um, and you see over time their populations have, have gone up as the forest has grown older. The eastern toey is, is the exact opposite. Require, requires uh, uh, shrubby habitat to make a living, so young forests. The problem with shrubby habitat is that it grows up. So if you, if you have a lot of it in the, in the first half of the century, of the 1900s, um, you can have a lot of toeys, but as that forest grows, or as that young shrubland grows up into a forest, the, the toeys go away. They go find other, other shrublands elsewhere. So again, we're, we're kind of focusing, or we're, we're in this state here where we have this, this kind of, this older robust forest. Uh, but what we want is that, that mixture across the landscape, across woodlots, um, essentially to diversify your holdings. So I'll leave a couple points here um, about our forest. Uh, you know, again, I mentioned the, I should say, uh, the, the privately owned, it's really kind of family owned, family forest. So folks like you and I who own a woodlot, who own 100 acres, who own 30 acres in our backyard. Um, and it's really the collective decisions of all of us on the landscape, uh, these private decisions that happen between perhaps you and your spouse or just, just yourself um, that impact the public good. So clean water, Robust wildlife habitat, foliage, our, uh, our, our timber markets, all that depends on private actions. All these public goods de depend on private actions. And it's pretty amazing that you know, for over 400 years, we've actually had a pretty vibrant uh, green infrastructure here in New Hampshire. Um, that we are all stewards of our natural resources. And so the, the decisions that you make on your woodlot, they obviously affect what's going on on your property, but it also affects the wildlife that are on your property that, that don't know what boundaries are and go across and move, move about. So. Um, it's important to learn, um, to learn what's out there and learn what's, what's important. I would, would point out the bulk of our landscape, the bulk of our forest is susceptible um, to natural disturbances, but also to human disturbances, such as development and other, other things like that. So um, what is green was considered our green infrastructure in New Hampshire may not always be green uh, in the future. So with that, I'll leave, um, I'll leave a little PSA is that, you know, we can, uh, I'll give you a kind of brief history of, of what's going on here in New England. But I'm happy to uh, to go for a walk with you on your woodlot if you have one, or uh, your community's woodlot, or anything like that, and um, and talk about your forest structure that's out there. So, I think we'll see. We're saving questions till later time, right? Yep. Great. Thank you. Yep.